Okay, we're ready to go. Hey, everyone. I'm Ellie Zizone, and you're tuned in to the first webinar in our Three Weeks of Peak series. This one is called Sourcing Your Production Outside of China. And we have a really strong lineup over the next few weeks, and space is limited. So head to this link and make sure you don't miss a thing. So today we've got, first of all, a great crowd. Thank you all for coming. Um, and we also have two great presenters. And this is our agenda. Today we're gonna discuss uh, under understanding the pros and cons of working outside of China, saving on production costs, optimizing sourcing based on export specialties, avoiding supply chain issues, and getting to know China alternative origin ports and pricing. But first, here's a quick refresher or intro for those of you unfamiliar with Fredos. Fredos is the world's largest freight marketplace, helping thousands of importers like you book and manage freight across over 75 providers. The key difference with Fredos is that we help you navigate pricing with real visibility into the current market and you can manage all your shipments and billing in one platform. And that's all rounded off with great technology and human support. Um, if you haven't already, you can sign up for a free account at fredos.com. Now I'd like to introduce Nathan Resnick, our source of knowledge and CEO and founder of Sourceify. Um, also a reminder, we'll be taking questions at the end, but you can send them uh, through Zoom uh, anytime throughout the webinar. Um, if you haven't done this before, just click on the questions box and submit your question. Uh, and now, without further ado, Nathan Resnick. Awesome, how's it going? Thanks so much for having me. Really excited to, to be here today. and. You know, just uh, wanted to give a heads up. One of the things I noticed is I won't be able to control the slides. So maybe I'll just, you know, drop a quick next uh, when we're ready to move forward. Um, but, you know, really excited to be on here and, and really appreciate the Freitos team for having me. You know, it's uh, always a pleasure to work with them. You know, whenever we tell our customers about handling freight at Sourceify, we always recommend Freight OS to really, you know, give you that visibility uh, into pricing and different routes to make sure your shipments are handled in a proper way. Um, a bit of background, you know, people always ask how I started Sourceify, you know, the fastest growing B2B manufacturing platform. We help hundreds of companies produce products across Asia. Um, we've got our own offices now in China, Vietnam, India, and Pakistan, so we're well diversified from a production standpoint. For me, my background actually stems in China. So 10 years ago, I used to live uh, with a host family, didn't speak English, uh, and attend a local Chinese high school. I speak fluent Mandarin, started importing my own products uh, over 10 years ago and just became so fascinated by the power of factories and how products are produced. So I started importing, you know, my own sunglasses, watches, hats, um, you know, dozens of different products and realized that there was a lack of transparency in overseas production. And by transparency, I mean that if company A and company B went to the same factory to produce the same product at the same uh, volumes, at the same order volumes, they would get back different pricing. And so for us at Sourceify, you know, we really try to be your boots on the ground, uh, make sure you're getting the most competitive pricing while also maintaining the highest levels of quality control and lead times in production. So, you know, today really the focus is around producing products outside of China, especially with the current trade environment. There is a lot of buzz going on and a lot of you know, important knowledge out there that you should learn in regards to shifting production. Um, so you know, let's dive right in and uh, hit the next slide and uh, start going uh, forward. So, you know, one of the key advantages of, of working outside of China is really around the production cost. And when we look at the cost of a product, it usually stems from raw material and labor costs. Now, in China, over the past 15, 20 years, the costs of labor have continued to increase, whereas outside of China in countries like Vietnam, India, uh, Bangladesh, 
you know, the costs of labor right now are, you know, much more affordable uh, than China. The dynamic that you really have to understand is where the raw material stems from. And right now, pretty much, you know, every company from Fortune 500s to Amazon sellers to, you know, D to C uh, e-commerce startups are all looking to produce products outside of China. But the main challenge is that the raw material sources outside of China are not super broad. So, you know, I know in the next uh, slide, we're going to dive into specific products that can be produced in each country. Um, but the specialization in each country is going to become very important. And I think one of the reasons why China has become such a big manufacturing hub for the world is because their access to raw materials is so great. Um, and so as a U.S. brand, I think right now, regardless of what happens in the future with these tariffs, you know, it's going to be important to consider production uh, outside of China and to be able to produce products in uh, other developing countries. But one of the other challenges you're going to have to understand is that the infrastructure a lot of times outside of China uh, lags quite a bit. You know, when I was in Vietnam, actually just last week in our office in Ho Chi Minh, you know, really just the infrastructure there isn't as robust as, as China. And so lead times can become a challenge um, and production delays can be more common. So let's jump to the you know, next slide um, and dive in uh, even further. You wanna pop to the next slide? Awesome, so, oh, uh, to the graph. So, you know, here's one of the components that we look at is obviously um, factory salaries uh, in China and outside of China. Um, you know, these are basically average estimates. Uh, a lot of these salary costs with factory workers depends on where the specific factory is. You know, if the factory is closer to bigger cities like Guangzhou or Shenzhen, the, you know, uh, labor rates of these employees in these factories are gonna be much higher. Whereas, you know, as you, as you get farther and farther outside of the main cities, the labor rates are going to go down. So when you really analyze your cost to produce your product, you know, typically when you're working with a contract manufacturer, they're going to give you those all in costs. Um, but you might want to also ask for a breakdown, especially as you grow, ask for a breakdown of what are the actual you know, component costs. Let's say you're producing a watch, you might want to understand, well, what's the cost of the watch hands, the watch strap, the watch movement, you know, what are these actual uh, unit costs uh, behind each component that make up my product? And then also the labor rates, you know, how long does it actually take to assemble a watch? Um, and what does that translate into from a labor cost standpoint can, uh, component? So let's uh, jump forward and go to the next slide and, and we'll talk about specialties by each country. Um, and so, you know, really in Vietnam, it's primarily around garments. Uh, furniture, a lot of wooden furniture, footwear and jewelry, a lot of the big, you know, Fortune 500 athleisure and athletic brands like Nike and Lululemon have been producing a lot through Viet Vietnam. Um, you know, Pakistan has been great for cotton goods, leather items. They do do a, a lot of furniture there as well, um, as well as some, you know, precious uh, stones and minerals. Mexico is you know really a dynamic area i mean especially uh where we're headquartered at source five here in san diego you know making trips to mexico is is very easy um, and there tends to be a lot of uh, electrical equipment and, and components that are made there one thing that i want to really touch on with mexico is that a lot of the raw material uh, from these factories that are produced in mexico actually comes from asia so if you're booking out you know a production line of um, you know, shirts or hats, whatever it may be in Mexico, a lot of the raw material that produced those textiles is actually coming uh, from Asia. In India, I think a lot of, uh, you know, handcrafted jewelry comes out of there, some really cool ceramics, leather is very strong there. Um, and then in the Philippines, you know, what's interesting about the Philippines is they have uh, a growing sector of free economic zones. So though the raw material sources in the Philippines are limited, you can actually uh, have your factory in the Philippines import products from other parts of Asia in these free economic zones for free, manufacture that product uh, in that country or in, excuse me, in that free economic zone and then export it for free uh, from the Philippines as well. And the reason why the Philippines government has set up 
more and more of these free economic zones is to really boost uh, the you know labor rates and the uh, employment rates in these areas around the free economic zones where unemployment may be very high. In Taiwan, there's you know primary uh, electronics manufactured there, um, you know some jewelry and textiles, but the cost of production for you know jewelry and textiles in Taiwan is is always relatively high. Um, so these are you know really just a kind of broader spectrum of, of what you know countries specialize in and what goods. But I think the key dynamic to understand is really you know diving into where the raw materials to produce your products uh, stem from. So let's uh, jump to the next slide here. So, you know, like I said, the key question here is to ask where those raw resources come from. Um, and then right now, especially, especially in, in Vietnam, uh, when you're dealing with larger factories, a lot of these factories are already at capacity. And so their production lines have been booked up through the rest of the year, sometimes all the way through 2020 already. Um, and those are the big factories. You know, if you're a Fortune 500, those are going to be, you know, the factories with, uh, you know, over a thousand employees or more. Um, but most of the e-commerce companies are primarily working with, you know, small, medium-sized factories that are always looking to grow. Um, and so this is why I think it's really, really important to understand, you know, uh, and be on the same page with your supplier in regards to sales forecasting, you know what upcoming POs do you have that you're planning to place? You know, the more, uh, I guess, you know, heads up that you can give your factory, the better off that they're going to be uh, to produce your products effectively. You know, so if you can be transparent with them and say, hey, you know, we're planning to place 10 POs in the next 12 months, you know, here's what the products are probably going to be like, they're going to be able to prepare growth to, you know, meet uh, your capacity requirements because right now outside of china you know definitely factories are growing very fast um, but it also means when they're growing their team very fast the skill of the labor force is not as high as a factory let's say in china that's you know been producing these products for 10 or 15 or 20 years um, the other key question you're going to have to ask you know your freight forwarder um, you know hopefully it's freight os is how does exporting from this country actually work you know exporting products from the Philippines or Vietnam can be different from exporting uh, from China. And in regards to the duty rates, you know, that's where you're gonna have to actually talk to your customs broker because the duties are calculated based on the country of origin. And, you know, one thing that you really need to be cautious of is there are some Chinese factories that are, you know, selling uh, new facilities in Vietnam or, you know, Malaysia or the Philippines. Um, and a lot of times these, these facilities outside of China that they've uh, started might not be providing enough value add to the goods where they might just be uh, packaging up the products into boxes that were already made in China and that your product was already shipped as a finished good from China to, uh, let's say, the Philippines. And so for your product to actually change uh, country of origins, you really have to uh, you know, create significant value add to that product in that country of origin. Um, and the other key component here is product regulations, you know, especially with, you know, products that might have FDA requirements, like one product that always comes to mind that a lot of people um, miss out on or really, you know, overlook is sunglasses, you know, to import your sunglasses into America, your factory has to be uh, FDA approved because sunglasses are technically a medical device that protects your eyes from the sun. So really, as you're exp expanding into new product lines and working with new factories, please, please make sure that they have the right certificates uh, to produce that product. And that's something that we do for our customers at Sourceify. It's one of you know the key reasons to, to work with us is making sure that you know your products aren't going to get stuck at customs because your factory doesn't have the right uh, certificate to you know actually produce your product and uh, have that product sold into America. So let's uh, jump forward uh, to the next slide. Um, and, you know, when we talk about shifting, you know, supply chains and, 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 you know, moving production, I think it's always key, I mean, anywhere in the world to work with, um, you know, a sourcing team, whether it be Sourceify uh, or, or others, and, you know, make sure you have price visibility. I mean, the way that we work at Sourceify is with all of our customers, all of our products, we always get our customers two to five price quotes on their products 
uh, to manufacture them. So they already have that price visibility. I mean, you never want to be single sourced ever. If you know something were to happen to your factory, then all of a sudden you have to scramble to figure out one that uh, can produce your products. So you don't run out of uh, inventory. Always consult a customs officer or a customs broker to understand you know, what duties you're going to be paying when you're importing your products. You know, you really have got to look at your whole supply chain. You can't just look at the unit costs. You can't just look at the freight rates. You can't just look at the you know, duty costs. You've got to understand the whole picture and how much is it going to cost you to actually get your product uh, landed to your customer. And then, you know, map out your shipping options, which, you know, is a great uh, transition into what, what Freight OS does. So you know, I'll let, uh, you know, you guys take it from here and, and you know, really excited and happy to answer any sourcing or manufacturing questions at the end. Awesome. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, so now we're going to go to my colleague, Tal, for a quick discussion about China alternative origin ports and pricing. And then we're going to get to the viewer questions. Okay, so take it away, Tal. Thank you, Nathan, <clears throat> for that very interesting presentation. I know that I learned quite a lot from it, and I'm sure the audience did as well. Um, as Ellie said, my name is Tal Cohn. I'm a freight marketing price, pricing, I'm a freight market pricing analyst at Freightos. What I'd like to do with you today is pick up from where Nathan left off about your shipping options and take you through some of the major ports you might be shipping from as you look at sourcing outside of China and what you can expect from the transit times and the prices compared with what you might experience when shipping from China. Uh, when we get to that section, I'll be addressing just ocean freight, not your entire landing cost, landed cost, but this should help you give you a sense of the additional charges that you may encounter as you're doing your shipping. Uh, following along with Nathan's presentation, I'm going to highlight the Southeast Asian countries that he presented and compare those with China for you, keeping the focus here on LCL shipments. Um, in the first set of slides here, I want to familiarize you with the geography of the countries and the major ports in each region of them so you can get a bit of sense of where you might be shipping from. And the first country that we're looking at here is Pakistan. As you can see, there are two major hubs in Pakistan. One up in the north is Lahore, and in the south we have Karachi. Karachi is actually the one that's touching the ocean, so uh, anything that might be produced in the north, while it would be ideally routed through Lahore, really it's going ultimately to Karachi to get onto the boat and, uh, and go internationally. The next one is Vietnam longer and more narrow country, kind of more spread out. In the north, by the capital Hanoi, you have Haiphong, and in the center you have Da Nang. And then in the south, by Ho Chi Minh, there are a number of different terminals. Vung Tau is one of the more primary ones, but uh, you might look up just the name Ho Chi Minh itself. Uh, that will generically cover a lot of the, the terminals that are located at the location. Sorry, wrong way. Taiwan. In the north, we have Keelung, uh, Taipei as well, but uh, primarily the, the ocean, uh, the seaport is Keelung that services Taipei, Taichung in the middle, and then Kaohsiung down in the south. The Philippines, in the north, we have Manila and Subic Bay slightly to the west of it. You don't see it on the map, but it's uh, within that red circle there that we have up in the north by Manila. In the middle is Cebu, and in the south is General Santos. And in India, much larger country, it's uh, got a lot more ports and the primary ones service kind of different areas within India. So in the north central uh, part of India, you have New Delhi. To the northeast, you have Kolkata. In the southeast, you have Chennai. The southwest, you have Mumbai and Nahavashiva. And straight west, you have Mundra. India is kind of interesting. Uh, different from the other countries because whereas uh, shipping from the other countries we mentioned, you're typically going to be sending goods to the east through the, over the Pacific Ocean to the west coast of the United States. And so your shipping costs and your transit times are going to be the fastest to the west coast. And then as you go further to the east of the U.S., those items will increase. India, because of its geographic location, and depending on where you're doing your production, you might have shipping go eastbound, coming from the east of India, going over the trans going over the Pacific Ocean, just like the rest of Southeast Asia. Or things might go westbound if you're trying to hit the east coast of the United States, 
with ships traveling through the Suez Canal and across the Atlantic Ocean. And in a moment, I'll show you about transit times and pricing differences between China and the other countries that we're presenting here. Typically, what you're going to see is that servicing, again, to the West Coast will be the fastest and cheapest. And as you go further to the East, it gets slower and more expensive. But with India, since it's such a large country and uh, you have different routing options depending on where you're doing your production and where you're shipping from, the ranges are going to be much larger and the pricing is going to be actually most expensive to Houston because, the direct, because of the direct routing towards the East Coast via the Suez Canal. So it's going to be very important to make sure that you know exactly where you're shipping from and where you're doing your production in order to get a good handle on what kind of lead time you need and what kind of uh, budget you need to set up for your freight. So looking at the timing, just port to port here, as we go from China, which is uh, probably where most of the people on the, uh, in the audience are doing their production right now, to the other countries, we can see how many days it's going to take to get to Los Angeles, Houston, and New York. The countries that are nearby China, as you can expect, Vietnam, Taiwan, and Philippines have similar transit times, even with Taiwan, since it's a little bit further to the east, you may gain a day uh, from shipping from Taiwan, whereas Pakistan and India is going to be much further, <coughs> excuse me, much longer, not just because it's further away, but also oftentimes there's transloading or there are stops on, along the way towards the United States where the ships uh, are not actively sailing and that will increase your transit time. And again, if you look at India down at the bottom, you'll see that whereas for every other country as we go from west to east, the transit times increase, India, as I mentioned abo above ab previously, Houston is the longest uh, transit time with Los Angeles and New York being shorter. And the range is also quite broad for the reasons I mentioned. And following suit is the kind of pricing that you might expect. I'm taking here as an example, a one and a half CBM, 300 kilogram shipment. And we're giving you just the port to port costs, okay? Not including pickup and delivery, but including the terminal costs and the warehousing costs, both at the origin and the destination. You see once again, that as you go from the west to the east, in most cases, the price is increasing. But with India, to get to Houston, the, uh, the price is higher on average than getting to Los Angeles and New York. Uh, so when you look at this, you can see that also India has kind of the highest uh, range here, um, variance from the cost of shipping out of China. And the others, it's about $100, $150 more, just that port-to-port -port component for this one and a half CBM uh, sample shipment. So uh, I hope this information has been helpful to you and kind of puts these shipping options on the map. Uh, gives you a better idea of what kind of budgeting you need to do in terms of pricing and timing as you consider your different options for production outside of China. And if you need an actual quote on any of these shipping lanes, you can always visit the Freightos Marketplace at ship.freightos.com. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Tal. Um, now we're up to the question segment. Um, we do have a bunch. Uh, I, can, I can't get to all of them. I really appreciate everyone sending a question. Um, maybe you can follow up either with someone at Fredos or uh, with Nathan. But um, uh, I guess our first question will be, um, uh, how do we connect with the marketplace of countries other than China? We have Alibaba for China. So what is there for other countries? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, there is no other marketplace like Alibaba for other countries. Um, and, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why Sourceify exists is because to produce and source products in other countries, you've got to have boots on the ground floor. Um, you know, there's a lot more that goes into producing products uh, outside of China than in, I would say. Um, and, and, you know, to access a lot of these factories outside of China, um, you know, you're either going to have to work with, you know, a, a local expert or go over there yourself, I'd say. Okay. Um, there was another, I think it, this was a follow-up to what you were mentioning about Vietnam. Um, so maybe you can speak more to the com 
capacity constraints in Vietnam? Definitely, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, the challenge with capacity in Vietnam right now is that there's so much demand and the demand uh, far you know, outpaces the supply where you know, Vietnam is a country of about 90 million people. You know, there's a growing factory base. I was, I was just there last week and you know, driving around uh, the countryside there, going to different factories, you see you know, tons of factories that are just being built. Um, and so it's a very interesting dynamic right now where I think in the future it will become a very, very strong manufacturing hub. And it, and it is a strong manufacturing hub today. It's just that the you know, capacity of Vietnam as a whole right now is, is very limited. And also, if you look at the number of people there, you know, there's not nearly as many people as China that has over 1.3 billion people. And so with this increased demand, you know, labor rates could go up pretty significantly uh, pretty soon in Vietnam as well as, you know, more and more factories try to hire uh, labor. So that, that's kind of the dynamic in Vietnam right now. Okay, great. Uh, the final question, I guess, we'll take is, uh, will a recording be sent out? Um, yes, it will. Uh, look in your inboxes tomorrow for not only a recording, but the slideshow. And also, I wanted to mention one other thing that uh, we want to sort of try out is um, we really want to ask you guys, uh, have you changed your sourcing to outside of China? Um, we think that these are important stories to share for people who, who import um, because it is a big step to take. And uh, I'm sure many of you have really good stories that we can share. So more details will follow uh, in the follow-up email. And with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And of course, a big thanks to both of our presenters, Nathan and Tal. Thank you guys very much. Um, and one more, one more reminder, uh, we're doing another one of these next week on partnering on fulfillment. And uh, another one after that, again with Tal. Tal will be taking center stage. Um, and we hope to see you all there. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And take care, everyone.